Have you ever thought about that old space show from the 1960s? It was so cool, with all those adventures in space. There are lots of neat facts about it. From showing different kinds of people to telling interesting stories, that show really left an impression. Do you have a favorite memory from watching it? Maybe it's the excitement of seeing the spaceship go on its missions, or the interesting ideas that made you think. Let's hear your stories. What's the coolest thing you remember about that show? Share your memories below. We want to hear from you. Keep watching for more fun stuff about that space show. Every episode has something cool to discover. In the late 1960s, a TV show burst onto screens, taking viewers on a journey through the stars. He introduced audiences to a diverse crew exploring the vast cosmos, promoting themes of unity and optimism. The show's influence reached far beyond entertainment, inspiring many to pursue careers in science and space exploration. He continues to shape science fiction and real-world technology, captivating audiences with his vision of a brighter future. Even today, he remains a beacon of hope, inspiring new generations with his message of exploration and cooperation. Nichelle Nichols almost left the series after the first season but stayed because Martin Luther King, who was a fan of the show, told her she was the only black actor on TV in a role worth having and she was a role model to his children. Each cast member had a favorite episode. William Shatner's was The Devil in the Dark. Leonard Nimoy's was This Side of Paradise. DeForest Kelly's was The Empath. James Doohan's was The Doomsday Machine. Nichelle Nichols's was Plato's Stepchildren. George Teke's was The Naked Time. And Walter Koenig's was Spectre of the Gun. Walter Koenig's Pavel Chekhov character only shared the screen with Grace Lee Whitney's Janus Rand character in the motion picture. They had been regulars on the original series at different times and did not share any scenes in the other three films they had both appeared in. In the world of TV, the actors from the show made a big impression that went beyond just acting. After one season did really well, William Shatner, for example, said he believed in UFOs. He talked about seeing something strange when he was young, and other people in TV said similar things. Then George Teke got a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in 1986 for his work on TV. It shows how much he influenced the TV world. DeForest Kelly first showed up on Star Trek in an episode called The Corbomite Maneuver. That was just the beginning of his journey into sci-fi TV, and it left a lasting mark. George Teke reprised his role as Hikaru Sulu for the 26 Internet, only series phase Roman 2, after the suggestion of co-star Walter Koenig. In an episode titled Charlie X, it's mentioned that the Enterprise has 428 members on board. Additionally, there's a Star Trek novel called Ishmael, featuring a crossover with the television series Here Come the Brides, which starred Mark Leonard. In the novel, Spock reveals his mother's full name to be Amanda Stempel Grayson, a descendant of Brides Aaron Stempel, played by Mark Leonard. In the realm of sci-fi entertainment, some actors truly stand out for their memorable performances. One such actor, recognized for his role as Lieutenant Commander Montgomery Scott, left a lasting impression on fans. His skill in handling engineering dilemmas aboard the USS Enterprise became a defining feature of the beloved series. Another actor, known for portraying the youthful and energetic Pavel Andreevich Chekhov, sometimes felt his character lacked humor in the script. Despite this, his acting added richness and likability to the crew of the famous starship. Then there was an actor who brought a sense of mystery and intelligence to his role as a logical and enigmatic Vulcan officer named Mr. Spock. His portrayal of Spock's inner struggle between thinking logically and dealing with emotions deeply resonated with viewers, making him a memorable part of the show's history. Each actor brought something special to their characters, making the show's impact lasting and widely appreciated. Their performances continue to engage audiences of all ages, showing how significant the series remains in popular culture. In the TV series from 1966 until she passed away on July 30, 2022, Nichelle Nichols, who played Lieutenant Nyota Yoshira, was the last regular female cast member alive. She was important because she was a great actress and showed that anyone, no matter their background, could be on TV. Chekhov's middle name was Andreevich, which meant his dad's name was Andre. This detail gave more insight into Chekhov's background and made him more interesting to fans. Kirk once said there were 12 ships like the Enterprise, but a book from 1973 listed 14 starships. Fans debated why there was a difference, wondering about the other ships' missions and captains. People still love the original series and all its little details, inspiring many new shows and a big fan community. In Star Trek's early days, clever visual effects were employed to simulate the movement of turbolifts. The DVD commentary reveals that a rotating drum with a cutout slot allowed light to create the illusion of motion. 
James Duhon, known for his role in the series, had a personal connection to a storyline detail. In Star Trek IV The Voyage Home, his character, Dr. Nichols, sported an I Quit Smoking badge, symbolizing an engineer's break from a habit. This choice resonates with Duhan's real-life experiences shaped by his father's struggles with alcoholism in British Columbia, Canada. On the Enterprise, attentive viewers might notice crew members diligently jotting down notes with clipboards and pens. However, a curious observation arises these crewmen often stare at panels adorned only with colored lights, lacking any discernible names, numbers, or functions. Such details provide a glimpse into the meticulous crafting of the show's visual elements, blending practical effects and subtle character touches. These nuances, though not always immediately apparent, contribute to the immersive experience of the iconic series. Leonard Nimoy declined to direct a Star Trek film in 1994 because Spock's role was a cameo, which didn't interest him. Consequently, Spock's character was edited from the screenplay. William Shatner, an expert equestrian, helped Sir Patrick Stewart with horse riding tips during the filming of the same movie. Gene Roddenberry and Jerry Anderson admired each other's work, with Roddenberry sharing scotch with Anderson at Pinewood Studios. Martin Landau turned down the role of Commander Spock, leading Leonard Nimoy to join the cast. Space 1999 shares similarities with Star Trek, including a character named Koenig, a prime directive, and thematic parallels. Catherine Schell was considered for a role in Star Trek Voyager, and Jonathan Frakes, who starred in The Next Generation, directed a live-action version of Thunderbirds. In the 1966 TV series Star Trek, the opening theme had lyrics written by Gene Roddenberry to secure co-writer credit and royalties alongside composer Alexander Courage. This move stirred resentment from Courage, who felt swindled by Roddenberry's actions. Despite their collaboration ending after the first season, the theme's music continued to be used in spin-off projects. The word hell was notably used five times in the series, twice as an expletive rather than a reference to damnation. These instances added a unique dimension to the dialogue, deviating from typical language usage for the time. Uhura, portrayed by Nichelle Nichols, became one of the first black regular characters on television, breaking stereotypes prevalent at the time. Her portrayal inspired viewers like Whoopi Goldberg and had a profound impact on individuals such as Ronald McNair, who saw the series as a vision of a future where people of different races worked together. Nichols' influence extended beyond the screen, as she was later hired by NASA to aid in recruiting minorities and women to the astronaut program. In one episode, Kirk establishes the total crew aboard the Enterprise as 428 people. William Shatner appeared in episodes of three different series with George Teke and Nichelle Nichols, the original series, the animated series, and Futurama. In the first season, only Shatner and Leonard Nimoy had their names appear in the opening credits. It wasn't until the start of the second season that the opening credits were slightly extended to include DeForest Kelly as well. The names for James Duhon, Walter Koenig, Nichelle Nichols, and George Teke have all appeared in the closing credits for all three seasons of the show, since they didn't always appear together in every episode. Following the final release of Star Trek Nemesis in 22, James Duhon passed away. Despite being often labeled as a low-budget series, its per-episode budget was comparable to contemporary shows like Lost in Space and Mission Impossible. Today, broadcasters and streaming services offer three alternate presentations of the original series, the original special effects version in original aspect ratio, the original special effects version cropped for widescreen, and the remastered special effects version in original aspect ratio. Each version may undergo additional edits by broadcasters. In the 1966 TV series, Diana Muldor played scientist before becoming Dr. Pulaski on The Next Generation. She accepted the role with the condition that the character's name be changed to Catherine. Kirk's nickname for McCoy Bones originates from the term sawbones, often used for surgeons. This term was familiar to the cast due to their backgrounds in westerns and military dramas. The series drew controversy for its multi-ethnic crew, reflecting Gene Roddenberry's vision of a future free from racial conflicts. Roddenberry aimed to depict a future where differences like race and nationality were irrelevant, much like the absence of religion in the 23rd century. The show's progressive portrayal of diversity was ahead of its time. In the realm of television, William Shatner penned the Tech War series of science fiction books distinct from his work on the show. These writings spawned TV movies and a short-lived series, with Shatner both acting in and directing various episodes. DeForest Kelly's final appearances on TV were in Equinox and What You Leave Behind. His last film outing was in Star Trek Insurrection. 
It was common for shows of the era to share minor cast members who appeared across various productions filmed in the same studios. Faces familiar from Batman, Mission Impossible, Get Smart, The Time Tunnel, Lost in Space, and The Wild Wild West, and even The Twilight Zone often made appearances. Upon her death, Grace Lee Whitney was cremated and her ashes are in her family's possession. She is the only one of the three female regulars not to have their ashes launched into space. Nichelle Nichols was the only regular cast member not to reprise her role in crossovers with the spin-off projects, although Yuhira was seen in archive footage in Trials and Tribulations. DeForest Kelly, one of the four main cast members, is the only one who never appeared in The Man from U.N.C.L.E., The Twilight Zone, or The Outer Limits. Insignias adorned uniforms on each starship and starbase. The arrowhead symbol represented the Enterprise, while the boomerang shape signified Starfleet Command. Walter Koenig received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in 2012, located at 6679 Hollywood Boulevard. During the era of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, three Klingons gained legendary status corps Kang and Koloff. Captain Kirk encountered all three during the original series and faced a manifestation of Kalos, the revered founder of the Klingon Empire. In the series, Melanie Shatner, daughter of William Shatner, made a cameo in The Final Frontier, directed by her father. DeForest Kelly, known for his role, favored the Empath episode. Despite the Prime Directive's rule against revealing technology, instances of equipment being left behind occurred. Captain Janeway acknowledged this, reflecting on the error's challenges and differences in approach. The characters navigated uncharted territories, facing threats from Klingons and Romulans with technology still in its infancy. Their methods might not align with present-day standards, yet their legacy endures. In the early days of filming, there were tensions on the set. George Teke said that William Shatner's big ego caused problems between them. Teke claimed Shatner wanted more time on screen, so he'd have lines and scenes cut. This made other actors upset. DeForest Kelly, who played Dr. McCoy, got honored on Canadian stamps for Star Trek's 50th anniversary. Grace Lee Whitney, who played Yeoman Janice Rand, had struggles with alcohol and drugs as she revealed in her autobiography. Behind the scenes, there were conflicts and personal battles that shaped the show's history. In the behind the scenes stories of the 1966 series, DeForest Kelly, who was really liked by everyone, got along well with his co-stars. His friendly and professional attitude made the set a happy place to work. The famous green captain's uniform wasn't just for looks. It was made to fit William Shatner comfortably, even when his weight changed during filming. This helped keep his appearance consistent and made sure he was comfortable while acting. When George Teke initially said no to being in the Wrath of Khan, William Shatner stepped in and convinced him to change his mind. Teke's role in the film added to the story and strengthened the bond among the original cast members. Looking back, these stories give us a peek into how the cast and crew work together to make the series and movies we love. Every decision, from costumes to casting, played a big part in making the franchise memorable for years to come. Did you know that one of the actors from a popular 1960s TV series was honored with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in 2004? He also played a key role in creating the Klingon language for a famous sci-fi movie. His work laid the groundwork for the language, which later became so developed that even Shakespeare's plays and the Bible were translated into it. In a later movie, his character humorously complains about the challenges of understanding Klingon. Additionally, another actor from the same series appeared in a recent biopic about a famous singer, but unfortunately, she passed away before the movie finished its run in theaters. These tidbits offer intriguing glimpses into the lasting impact of a beloved TV show and its cast members. In its depiction of Starfleet's operations, parallels can be drawn to the historical practices of the British Royal Navy. Like its naval counterpart, Starfleet patrols Federation space safeguarding interplanetary travel and trade akin to the Royal Navy's protection of the British Empire's interests. Furthermore, Starfleet undertakes scientific exploration and mapping missions, echoing the endeavors of notable Royal Navy voyages, such as those led by Captain James Cook and the joint expeditions of HMS Erebus and HMS Terror. Additionally, Leonard Nimoy, renowned for his portrayal of Spock, shared roles with actor Carl Steven, notably in Star Trek III The Search for Spock and Never Forget. Recently, James Doohan's son sought to acquire a wax replica of his father at auction, yet was outbid by an unidentified fan. In the show, ranks in the naval structure are depicted inconsistently. Lieutenants wear a single ensign stripe. LT Commander Scott and McCoy wear one twelve stripes of LT junior grade. 
Although Spock is regularly referred to as a LT commander, he wears a second full stripe, representing a full commander's rank. Captain Kirk wears two full stripes, one half stripe of a LT commander. Admirals wear a single oversized band. Joe Tormelin wears a single half stripe, a rank that does not exist. DC Fontana, one of the writers, used the initials DC because networks wouldn't hire women writers at the time. Her first name is Dorothy. DeForest Kelly, the only original cast member never to write an autobiography. 